What's going on? It's Joe Darlington from Being James Bond here to talk about the next installment of our uh, Bond. All right, all right, all right. Now, now. <laughs> See you back at the lodge. What? Yeah, nothing says summer than uh, a big winter uh, parka. Poppers, <laughs> buttons, and zippers. And zippers. <laughs> but you said. <laughs> If we could only uh, do effects that kind of put the... Yeah. yeah, that's right. Nothing says summer like um, a nice heavy winter coat when uh -huh. we're having this conversation. But it, I got, is, it is a nice coat, though. I got to It's, it's not it. a bad coat. It actually yeah. doesn't fit bad either. Mm. Um, and then I've got the uh, the Calvin Klein glasses that they actually still... I could get it. Well, they're, no, they're kind of a sign of the times. Yeah, they're no. a little... 1999? No? Yeah, those kind of come in and out, I think. They're going to come in and out, but I can't see a thing in them, so <laughs> I'm going to have to put them on the side. Joe, you know, this means only one thing. It can only mean one thing. We're here talking about the, the world, world is not, not enough. enough. Yeah, the world is not enough. <laughs> we're back 1999, yep. and we're talking about a premise. What was the premise again? Remind me. Uh, that, uh, wow, I'm still kind of getting over the fact that you said 1999. I'm saying to myself, good Lord, that was over 20 well, years let me, ago. Well, let me help your mind because <laughs> I'm going to open a nice, cold, crisp Heineken cool. uh, for you nice. with my bottle opener. Um, of course, because you're working... Uh, yes. It is a double O. I am trying the Heineken. double O for the first time. Well, let's get your review on this first. Okay. Heineken USA Incorporated did not sponsor this blatant product placement. Neither the Bond experience nor being James Bond were compensated in any way by the Heineken Corporation. We should only be so lucky. You didn't know this was going to be a uh, Heineken review as well. Know. Cheers, brother. Cheers, brother. Happy summer. Happy, happy summer with a winter coat. Oh, good lord, not bad. It does. It, it tastes like Heineken. I'll give it that. Tastes like a Heineken. Yeah. Ish. What was my theory earlier about Heinekens? You have to st uh, start you, on them. You've <laughs> got to start on them. You've got to finish on them. Mm. No matter what you put in between. Look yeah. at that. You got to. Oh, I was smart. He's using a coaster <laughs> and everything. All right, we're back. What, so, what was the premise? The premise is we we did our series with the firsts. Are the first ones the best? Because that was sort of my cockeyed theory, uh, which kind of held up. Not always, but a lot of times. Uh, we also wondered the third, the final Bond films. Do they always end off on a stinker? Uh, mm -hmm. Sadly, we decided for the most part that was more or less true. But then we said, "Hey, a lot of people feel that the third film is when each actor kind of hits their stride." Right. So we talked about Goldfinger. We, we talked about The Spy Who Loved Me. We did. Which means we're here to talk about. We're here. The world is not enough. That's right. All right. So overall, the world is not enough. And this is this is a film uh, that I've heard people talk about of late is kind of coming back into favor. Mm. You know, I know that there's there's films that kind of come back. You know, Quantum in some ways people have revisited Thunderball, um, but but the world is not enough, and it be could be because of Spectre. You know, things like that where people mm. are like, oh, I need to, yeah. I need that one gap filler to fill in because I've had kind of a, a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. So I need that palate cleanser. But overall, from a plot standpoint, what did you think of The World Is Not Enough? Uh, I think, actually, plot-wise, I think it's probably one of the best ones. And mm. it's kind of, um, it's sort of doing that Goldfinger, A View to a Kill style plot, but in um, a less on-the-nose way, uh, you know, where... Essentially, she's trying to destroy the other pipeline so that hers is the only one, and so she makes lots of money. Uh, yeah, very reasonable. And I, I find the um, there's sort of a subtext, which they kind of talk about, where she's talking about like her family, her people, her lineage, and how this is some somehow uh, something she was sort of born into. So mm. there's a little bit of... Uh, again, it, they don't really explore that very much. Right. Like, I mean, at the, there's a line where she says, it's mine and my people's. And I'm like, w which people's? Did, did we did we cover that? Right. Um, but overall, I think plot-wise, I think it works pretty well. I like, I like how Bond gets pulled into it, how there's that, um, without getting too personal and too, you know, this time it's personal. But, you know, M has that personal connection with Robert King. So I, yeah. I find that it works. To me, from a plot point wise it's cleaner than a lot of the Brosnan films mm. I mean we've talked about you know well die another day we hardly will leave to mention mm. you know kind of being all over the place coming from tomorrow never dies which I enjoyed but I enjoyed it because it was candy mm. it was fun it was uh, scene after scene of bombastic entertainment yeah. it was childlike yeah 
Now we're back to a more serious Bond intrigue mm. and spying yeah. and double cross. Yes. Yeah. And and you know personal connections mm. that go awry and you know Bond screwing up yeah. but also Bond on a mission. Yes. Yeah. And it's those types of tropes that I think make the plot really condensed but really smart at the same time. Yes. Yeah, and I, I do kind of like that double cross aspect of it. And um, you know, I, I we'll talk about it when we get there. I mean, I feel like it, there, there's probably a little bit. Um, uh, who said it recently? I think it was Calvin when he was talking about how um, it, it does have a soap opera-ish uh, feel to it, and I kind of can't agree with that more because yeah. um, I, when I think of uh, Fear Eyes Only. The Cristados is essentially double crossing James Bond. Mm -hmm. He's playing him for a fool, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of feel like at some point you just realize he's the bad guy and we just go forward. Right. But this one has that kind of moment where it's like, you know, ha, 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 it was me all along. It's, right, you know, right. So, but the Scooby Doo thing. Like, yeah, right, exactly. Jeepers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would, I would see that. I do see the soap opera moments. I think that what, what, keeps this a little bit more serious is the portrayal that Pierce Brosnan has mm. a bond in this. Now, yes. I, I think in GoldenEye, he was uh, very serious, but because he was kind of young and new in the role. Mm. And then Tomorrow Never Dies, it was definitely more whimsical. And it, yep. a lot of that had to do with the plot, uh, cracking wise, mm. winking, things like that. In this, it's it's a more mature. I mean, he even looks yeah. more mature. He's kind of grayed. Yeah, he's a little bit yeah. more seasoned. Yes. And instead of being cocky, I feel like he's very confident. It's that fine line. Yeah. No, I, I I'm with you there. I think as far as again, just sticking with the theory about you know each actor kind of getting into their groove, I think this is a great example of that because I, I think just in the opening, uh, the pre-title sequence. You know, boom! Boy, does he knock it out of the park! Like, he's got that that fero ferociousness to him. Um, I mean, I I just think it's just he's he. I think he's never been better, frankly. I agree. This is this is. I think this is Pierce's best film because in in um, Dying of the Day, and again, I blame Tamahori. It's it's literally. I I almost feel like every every scene, Tamahori's direction was just be really really cool. You know, and this, and you know, everybody's trying to be like, you know, like just posing and posturing, and and just we'll get to that when we get to it. But mm -hmm. um, no, here I think I think Brosnan is just spot on perfect. He's also really classy in this film. Yeah. I find that every scene that he's in, you know, the beginning part where you know he's got the foam and he's like King, the money, mm. you know, just the way he's dressed and the way he moves in this yeah. film is that you know, Brosnan doesn't get a ton of love mm. from the Bond community always, but mm. he is the epitome of spy class. Yeah. You know, this gentleman that is, is he has refinement around him, mm. and he can use it. Even when he goes to visit her, um, and they're about to go skiing, yeah. I mean, he yeah. flawlessly just picks up, and he's like, you know, I've come from a, for a, prepared for a chilly reception, yeah. Yeah. and then boom, they're skiing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to me, that's like that Bond traveler. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I, you're absolutely right. He, he is. There, there's a thing he's doing in this, and and, and talk about getting into the kind of minutia. But um, remember how we talked about in Goldeneye how we had these these big wide kind of cat like yeah, walking the movements. in the yeah yes. yeah the projections. Every time I watch this one, he's always doing something with his wrists. Like his wrists are very stiff. Yes. He's kind of making some kind of like stiff arm gesture. Yep. I, 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 like I said. It happens a lot, and I to the point where like I've noticed it many times. Where I was like, "Why is he constantly got his wrist?" So he is, and I truly believe he's an incredible visual actor. Yeah. Meaning, the amount of pantomiming and yes. theater yeah. movement that he does, this over projection, yeah. he is a master classman at it. Mm. So I felt like because he had hurt his shoulder, he was constantly almost doing like that mm. favoring. Okay, you know, he's kind of like you know that's my bad. Yeah, yeah. So when he's like running and things like that, he's favoring it. Right, right. When okay. he's kind of falls and he's you know even in the submarine yeah. he's doing something and he and he falls like this. Right, right. Like right. almost yeah, a right. robotic. Arms, it's like yeah. oh that's right my 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 shoulder. Yes, and, yes. But to me he is such. A master at that yeah. and then also you have him portraying a bond in here that is a sneaky bond you yeah. know he's disguising himself as somebody else he's mm. putting on an accent I mean when yes. you know dr. Jones you know says that whole Trotsky da, 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 and he's mm. like but da, 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 Oxford right, it's right, like, right right that's capable bond yeah 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 I that you know very no very true he is and and again it, it's and it, it's gonna sound critical but it's really not but it, I, I do Sometimes I get a sense from this movie. It's almost like you can you can 
imagine the conversation that he had with the director beforehand where he says, I want Bond to be a little more like this because I feel like I'm, I'm glad I have a prop nearby. You do. But I feel like constantly, constantly, he's constantly yeah. pointing guns in people's faces and it's like he's real big on constantly having the gun out. And and again, I, I, I like you said, not a criticism because I, I could see this. I, I, why, Bond should be a little more aggressive, should be a little more, a little more of an animal, a little more... And I, boom, I'm on board with it. But I, but I, it's just kind of a little noticeable, right? I kind of feel like it. I, yeah. I, I shouldn't notice it. Like maybe one little, just a little less of this would have would have worked. And I, I finally found a deficit with Brosnan as Bond with the women because I feel like mm. no matter you know weak or, or positive, but he has no chemistry with Christmas Jones. Thank God. Yeah, right. Well, none whatsoever. Yeah. Which we'll get to the Bond girls in a second. But <laughs> but let's 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 yeah. let's talk about the bad guys. And there's bad guy slash girl mm. yeah. in this film. Mm. Um, what did you think of them? Uh, I, I think, um, well, I, I starting with Renard, I kind of feel like a lot of build up, not a lot of payoff. <laughs> um, very okay. built up. And honestly, when we get to the the final, I mean, the whole thing is like, he feels no pain. He can he can push himself harder and stronger than any normal man. And then you get to the bat, the fight at the end and it's like, you know, it's just a regular fight. Like he's he's like there's, I mean, even in Tomorrow Never Dies, like there's that the big Aryan bad guy. He stabs him with the knife. He doesn't even feel it. He right. shrugs it off. I feel like it with when he's fighting Renard, he feels it, it looks like Renard's feeling every punch. There's like it's not like this guy is impervious to pain. Right. At least not that I'm seeing. It's almost like they just totally forgot that whole part. But you're right. They even had that in the trailer, if you remember, when they're talking right. about him. They had that hologram thing. Yep. There is literally no payoff. In fact, I would, no. I would actually go so far as to say that he winds up hurting himself more. He picks up the molten rock. He mm. he breaks his hand into the glass when right, she right. refutes him. Yes. And it's like at the end, the fight between them. I don't see any superhero. And shouldn't he be getting stronger mm. according to that whole thing? Why would you even introduce a plot point like that and not utilize right. it? Right. And and and, it, and they did, it's like sometimes they'll introduce a plot point and you just forget about it. They didn't forget about it in this. Like you said, there they, there was multiple times when they're showing him, look, he feels no pain. I mean, even that scene with him in Electra where he punches the, the, the table and the glass, which I, I never really kind of got that scene. Right. I, I always thought that was sort of awkward. I'm like, why, why am I watching this? But so, yeah, they're, they're, and he's like, no, I don't feel anything. And, he's, and it's like... Even he kind of can't believe he doesn't feel it. Right. So, so, so the buildup was still there. I mean, and that's not even too far from the finale of the film. Like that's right. close to the end. So you you feel like, well, they're they're obviously building to something, and it's boy, is it lacking? I mean, it, that whole fight with him in the in the sub almost feels like this was sort of like a reshoot sort of thing, like where something didn't quite go right. Well, let's just have them fight over here, and then we'll end it, et cetera. Well, I, I actually, and probably because we had a bad, bad guy in some of the plot points, I found that to be very boring. I mean, when I do watch mm. the film, yeah. the, the whole submarine part, once yeah. they get to the sub, actually, once he dives off, mm. you know, after he shoots her, yeah. to me, the whole film just goes downhill. I mean, it really is yeah. just, uh, and, and this is like, we're talking a lot about this. This is where Bond films either mm. really become fantastic, or they yeah. really become... Like a, a fizzle. Yeah, there are there are a lot of Bond films that I kind of feel do that, where they just sort of fizzle towards you know they, as they, as we start to get close to the end, we're kind of running out of steam and we just sort of got to get this thing done. And this is this is like that, where there's not a lot happening. And even as a finale goes, I, I've never really liked the, even the, the geography of that scene. Hmm. I kind of feel like it's hard to know who's where. Who's I mean, and again, it's. A, the whole subset, which is probably a little more accurate than some of the other subsets we've seen before, submarine sets. Right. Um, but um, I mean, it's it was it's all tight quarters, very claustrophobic. Again, probably realistic. It's all white. It's all just like very white background. Um, so yeah, it's, I just yeah, the, the finale doesn't do yeah. much for me. Yeah, and it, it so Electra. She's good. I, I, I will put it this way. I, I can recall. I remember when they first cast her, and this was probably the only thing I'd seen her in. Braveheart. I, I, I had seen Braveheart. Yeah. So this yeah. was not long after that, and I thought Braveheart was spectacular. I thought she was spectacular. I thought she, she's, she's really got that beautiful. Yeah. She's um. Beautiful. You, you know what I mean? Like, 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 it's sort of like on the on the border of, um, a little bit of innocence, but yeah. not too much. Slight. Very yeah. slight and tiny, and yeah. Yeah. So I thought I was very excited for her in the film. Yeah. Uh, and I think she's great. Again, like I said, I, I think she's really good. 
I think the the script doesn't really serve her too well when she's suddenly the bad guy. Like I said, yeah. there is that that that, that <laughs> I was the bad guy all along, M, and and they have this confrontation very, again, soap opera ish. You know, is I want to give you a gift, please open it. Now. Like I saw, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, a little. Little, little over the top, but I, but I, I, I do think she's very good, and I like the idea of her. But I love the idea of her, frankly, because that goes to that scene when Brosnan is looking through the um, toward the beginning, and he's watching the reels of, of her ha- yeah. having been kidnapped. There's a brilliant scene there when he touches the screen. Yes, yeah. and, and it's it's almost like he's touching the tear. Uh, yeah. I mean, boy, yeah, yeah, is that, that was good subtle. stuff. Was yes, nice. very nicely done. So that whole Ian Fleming winged dove type right. is happening. So I thought that was. Pretty well done, and you can see how Bond could be taken with her. I thought she was good, mm. but not great. And and I'll tell you where she falls short is I feel like some of her scenes, mm. I feel like they were almost like rehearsal scenes, like when they're skiing and they both stop, and she goes, "It's my pipeline to the world," and then she kind of like looks off to the left, like yeah. the grip guy got in the way, or you know she stepped on the wrong piece of tape. It just <laughs> take a look at that scene again. You're gonna be like, why yeah. is she just glancing down at her boot? That was the strangest thing. But the the movie is filled with those type of moments where it's mm. like, you know, you'll have no time left. You know, like mm. it's it's almost like you are almost there. But I I almost feel like the director should have been like, that was fantastic, Sophie. Yeah. But if you could just give it just ten percent more, ten yeah. percent more, and yet ten yeah. percent less, if you right. know what I mean. yeah. just some sort of direction. Because I actually think she's a good actress, mm. and I like the role the way it was written. Yeah, and I like I like that we got a female bad person. Mm. But I just felt like it just came up a little short for me. Yeah, yes, I I, I agree with that. I I think you're kind of hitting it spot on. Something just shy. I mean, I, I kind of feel like the movie as a whole. It's very close to being a great Bond movie, right. but this, but there's just things about it that just keep it, you know, not quite getting there. Yep. Um, one of those is not happily the style mm. aspects, as you can see by the ski coat. But yeah. I mean, that's he's wearing uh, the best suits, the ties. Yeah. You know, coming out of Tomorrow Never Dies, which was a lot of like casual Bond moments. Yeah. You know, he's back to that really like he looks like Bond. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. got the different parts in here. Even when he goes to that smaller casino and she bets the million dollars, he's got the tuxedo back on. Mm. Again, um, I have to say, I have to make mention, the watch, the Omega watch. Yeah. I love the fact that he had an impossible grappling hook and a laser. Like, that <laughs> yeah, thing does yeah. everything. It's it's like, yeah. the, it's like the Swiss Army watch of watches. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Swiss Army knife of watches. Yeah, that's it. But um, I, I love the fact that they paired... You know his lifestyle things in things that he could use as part of his spidem. Mm. Yes, I, I agree with that. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, I can recall watching that movie and and uh, somebody I was with saw it said, "Boy, that is one widespread collar." He, he's, he's wearing the, the, the kind of spread collar shirts at that point. I I, I I I think he looks great. I think all his his outfits are spectacular. Uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, I I I'm. Maybe the, the, the suit with the blue underneath, I was I thought... Oh, the I, linen suit, the George Lazenby Yeah, I, right, the, with, the yeah. White, with the blue underneath it. I remember thinking, when they got around to Die Another Day, I thought they got it better, because I thought the... Mm. Um, I liked the, the, the tan was a little darker in that one, yep. the blue was a little more muted, um, but... I, I agree with you, and they had some interesting picks. They had, like, black belts with brown shoes. They had some interesting mm. mixes going on with that. Um, the shoes were great in that, but I know we're, we're getting into like crazy detail. But um, what about the uh, the gadgets? Talk about having the exact thing for the exact occasion that you just got five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a little, 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 little too on the nose. Yeah, yeah. Much. I mean, th- there are those disturbing parts when Desmond Llewellyn says, "Never let them see you bleed." Yeah, and, and the whole thing, and then he he goes into the ground. Isn't that kind of it eerie? Is weird. It's eerie. It's like, did somebody know something? Was like... Yeah, it's, I I don't like seeing that scene. I mean, it's great to see him, but yeah, it's a little bit sad to I, see well, that. Well, it, it's it's bittersweet because I kind of feel like it's one of those scenes where exit. I if well, it's like how do we if if we know this is going to be his last one, let's give him a nice end off, and that's exactly yeah. what they do. So it's a nice scene for him to sort of you know end on. True. But then you kind of go, but. Area, they kind of seem to know that that was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a bit bizarre. Um, yeah. the the one other thing that I have to mention with all of this is um the music. So mm. with the music, 
aspect to this. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the music? Aces. Yeah. Aces. I, I, Energetic, right? Yeah. And, and I tell you, this 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 one really made me notice, like, sit up and take notice of David Arnold. Um, I mean, when he, I mean, obviously we had Goldeneye and the score was mm, pretty kind of swinging a miss. Uh, Tomorrow Never Dies comes along and they fix the problem and they bring in David Arnold and he does a great Bond score. And, and again, I, I loved it because he's not afraid to use the, the Bond theme. You know, even John Barry would sort of just just say that for special occasions, whereas David Arnold says, "Let's use it." I mean, it's it's great. Then the world isn't enough comes along, and it's like, wow. Yeah. I mean, the the pre-titled boat chase, that to me is like a quintessential oh David Arnold score. Yeah. Uh, I mean, quintessential. But he also, you know, he brings it down for you know, like the scenes with Electra. Uh, but I think when I really notice him is when he did the Caviar Factory. Because hmm. I thought, now that's interesting. Because this is a scene that says yeah. to me, like it's kind of, it's like it's kind of high tech, because it's because it's the blades and stuff, and the helicopters and stuff. But the whole scene feels like it, this is kind of we're here for fun for for a little while. Um, it's just a kind of like fun stuff happening, and it's almost like he knew enough to play the scene that way. And I thought yeah. this guy really knows what he's doing. That's a really good point. I think that um, you you said that about the caviar scene that he's got the ability to almost translate a scene on yes. how a person should feel about it. Yes. Like, listen to the music. Yes. I know what you're seeing, yeah. but listen to the music, and that yeah. should kind of tell you how to, you know, have some sort yeah. of equilibrium with your emotions. I, I, exactly. It, it, it kind of almost sets your expectations a little bit and says, yeah. this is this is a little, we're having a little fun here. Don't get too hung up on the, the little details of what's happening. Let's just have fun with it. And that's exactly what ends up happening. I, th I think David Arnold really is kind of one of the unsung treasures. You know, I mean... How do you replace John Barry? I mean, you don't do it, but you, but I feel like David Arnold was. I mean, t what a what a successor he was, and he really carries on a tradition, frankly. Yeah. So we, we need him back. We certainly do, and I kind of don't know why we, we can't never get left. him, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> someday we'll find him. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, we we've, we've sort of talked about the henchman, didn't we? Isn't Renard kind of the henchman? Uh. I guess sort of in a weird way, yeah. Is there another henchman that I'm missing? Uh, I mean, Davidoff's that, not the henchman. No, I mean, he's so a lackey. flunky, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we're not doing the henchman. So, all right, I mean, let's let's ask the question. Overall, mm. overall, how do you think this thing measures up to our theory? Um, I'll tell you what. I, I, can, I remember uh, when we were talking about Goldeneye, and we were asking, is that one the best? And I remember sort of saying, well... I feel like empirically, you know, talking about like we do, you know, like if you check all the boxes and stuff, yep. yeah. Um, I feel like you could argue that that one's the best, but I did say back then that the one I like personally is The World Is Not Enough. Yeah. Um, again, not not a perfect film, and frankly, I, you know, we've said it before, I don't think Rosin ever really got the perfect one. But, however, I think, you know, on a personal level, I think this, is the, this one gets the most fingerprints on the box. I feel like this is the one I'm most likely to pop in and watch. I do love the pre-titles are spectacular. I love a lot, a lot of what's going on. I think the story works. Um, again, certain things I would change about it. I think the Zukovsky character, by the way. Oh yeah. A little oddly out of place in this. I, I and feel he was like so um, good in Goldeneye. He was spectacular in Goldeneye. And again, it's one of those frustrations that I get sometimes. Like like you know, you've heard me talk about License to Kill. Yeah. They bring in Q, right? They bring in Q and they totally rewrite his character to make him fit the plot as opposed to bringing in an interesting character like a Columbo, Carambe, etc. Um, you know, why did you pass on an opportunity to bring in a, a character and, and write a new interesting character? Uh, so same here. I kind of feel like Zukovsky, again, and, and plus he's he went from a guy in GoldenEye who was, you know, he, he is kind of there to be entertaining and to kind of be a little bit of comedy relief, but he was still a pretty compelling, interesting character on his own right. Yeah, and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. This time I felt like we're just straight up doing comedy relief. He's and, a and little bit oddly, yeah. yeah, and it's funny too, like you said, Dangerous and Goldeneye, where he, he was ready to put a bullet in James Bond's knee. Here, he just has this m weird man crush on James yeah. Bond. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like that was so weird. So... Anyway, so yeah, the bottom line is the film is certainly clunky and it's hardly perfect, but I do think it's probably the best one that we got from Pierce. Yeah, I, I, 
I would agree. I think technically speaking, it's it's an interesting one. I mean, I still have a lot of heart for Goldeneye, mm. of course. It's the one that I probably see the most as far as with reverence. Yeah. Like I look at Goldeneye and I'm like, I respect you. Yeah. You know, I respect you enough. I'm not going to watch you all the time. Mm. This is the one, for some reason, it's on TV all the time too. Um, mm. It's on Netflix and things like that. Yeah. And I could just, you know, if, if I'm buying time between yeah. Danielle and I watching a series and she's in the bathroom finishing up for the night yeah. and I, I need 15 minutes of bond, yeah. Yeah. I'll put on The World Is Not Enough and I'll yeah. just watch a 15-minute thing because it is a series of really great scenes. Yes. Um, I just think that it's probably not 100% to me mm. because it does feel a little cobbled together. That's yeah. all. I, I think, you know, I think we were talking before about, um, you know, if you were introducing someone to Bond for the first time. Mm. I think if, if you were, if, if somebody said, I, I want an introduction to James Bond, but I only got 15 minutes, I think the pre titles from this one is probably not a bad one oh, to show. Yeah. You know, just as a very quick, you know, sampling of James Bond because I think that the chase is great. I mean, the, the, the banker scene is great. I love how that yep. concludes. And then just the boat chase and that score, you know, just just magnificent. So I think this is that's a pretty good that's, self-contained little. I would agree with you 100%. Yeah. All right, Joe. Did we knock another one out we of the We did. We knocked 1999. So yeah. are you ready to go to 2012? Wow. The new millennium. <laughs> did we just take a 13-year jump? I, well, that's, that's how it goes these days, yeah. <laughs> what the heck? That's kind of crazy, huh? So we're he heading to Daniel Craig yeah. land. Yes, Daniel right. Craig. Craig, not Craig. Not Craig. Not Craig. Yeah. Uh, so let's head over there. Let's head over to Skyfall. Let's do it. All right, this has been David Zaretsky. And Joe Darlington. We'll see you real soon. Take care. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.